it's a little bit fitting that we were talking about the astral plane tonight, because one of the things that Swami Panchadasi gets into, what do you've read, Swami Panchadasi, that funny little man, right? Uh, one of the things that he gets into is inspiration, and he has a beautiful, tiny little paragraph on it, in which he says, and uh, our mystery guest, I'm sure, will, will dig it because he's a master of inspiration. He says that there's a plane, there's a part of the astral plane where people are doing and creating and inventing everything that they've ever wanted to create or invent or build or do. But if in your life you wanted to be a great singer or a great architect or a great inventor, and if that has been the ruling force of your life, then when you die, you go to this part of the astral plane and you can create everything you've always wanted to do. But more important than that, he says there are people up there creating the things that we then get through inspiration. Like you suddenly get a lyric in your mind. It comes from nowhere. It's, you know, they're handing it down to you. That's what they say. Do you ever get that kind of feeling when you're writing? No. No. Well, I, <laughs> thank you, Swami Panchadasi. And now back to Derek Taylor. <laughs> All right. Well, you know. Where do you get your inspiration if it isn't from the astral plane, young man? <laughs> God heavens. Battle Creek, Michigan. Battle Creek, Michigan. A little closer to the microphone. No names, please. Just initials. Uh, oh, no, that's fine. You cut them off the back of uh, old shredded wheat boxes. Uh, sure. Right. I have a lot of inspiration in the back sure. of shredded wheat boxes. Just cut them up. This thing about inspiration, though, is important, I think, because like uh, everybody who does things kind of well gets it in some specific way. I mean, don't you get it writing? And there's no subways in L.A. You can't use that anymore. Do you get it? Do you get it when you meditate? Do you meditate to do it? Do you go away from people? Do you write in the midst of people? You know, where, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. Right. Usually the best inspiration is like, uh, well, you, and now I'm into a thing where um, if a song isn't finished until like it's recorded, because um, so many different things keep coming into view. If you write something about a river now, a month from now, you know, you get a whole different uh, view of what a river is, you know. Yeah. And so time is probably about the most important thing. So that the, the songs, in a sense, keep changing up. In fact, the only thing that stops them from changing is the fact that you have to put them down on tape. Yeah. And then afterwards, you know, you get, you listen to it a lot, you know. And it goes on changing. And it goes on changing. Right. Know? Because we play things now that we played like a couple of years ago that, you know, really nice. You know, like, I wish we could do them over again, you know. Well, the jazz people do. They do, yeah. They, know, can, they can keep doing but it. But like we're record companies don't yeah. buy that. You know? Well, you know, they, they, they try to sell it. But as you say, one of the things about your lyrics and your songs is that when you hear, you hear it the second time or the third time, you begin to catch things inside or just right, right on the surface. You don't even have to get too mystical yeah. about it. It's just right yeah. there. It's a very, very nice album, too, and one that uh, caught me. I was over at a friend's house, sitting down, and they put the thing on, and it just kind of like came in from the background. I know you can't listen to it the way other people do. You can't have that, that marvelous, you know, special separation of somebody being turned on to you. All you can do is turn on to yourself. But it was very nice, very nice indeed. That's nothing wrong with turning on to yourself. People do it all the time. That's fine. You can learn that way. You can learn, that, learn very well that way. Um... Do you have a feeling that, like, uh, the kind of music that you're writing now, or let me, let me put it positively, I found that talking to an awful lot of very young people, like 12, 13 years old, are tremendously turned on to your music. Very, very much, man. And the lyrics are, uh, the lyrics are a little bit special. You know, they're not, they're not, come on, baby, you're my girl, come on down behind the mill. And, uh, yeah, how about that? Oh, you're all down to the We all have to go through the old mill songs. There's some way to do it. That's, that was one of the early river songs. Yeah, right. <laughs> now, the mill's no longer there, right? I can dig it indeed. Yeah. He well, just got it. Yeah, all right. Get right. over there. That's Hang fine. It. Well, it's a microphone. <laughs> hey, uh, there's a, there's a, there's a very special feeling about things. I tell you, I want to play, I want to play a cut because there's been a tremendous amount of political material that's been going down. Uh, one man who does a lot of this material has been, de has been described as the greatest act since the Beatles, wasn't it? Something like that. And uh, there's been an awful lot of stuff going down about how wicked the war is and how wicked everything is. And it always tells it in very sort of wicked terms so that you, you, you sort of are alienated from the message. You know, it's like reading a newspaper. The horror that you get from a newspaper still has a distance from your face. You dig? Mm. You know, you, you're not, you don't internalize it. And most of the political songs that way, they're, they're basically, which side are you on, baby? Are you black? Are you white? Are you yeah. Viet Cong? Or are you Lyndon Johnson? And people think, well, right, I'm right and he's wrong. <laughs> but you've written a song that uh, gets away from that a bit. 
It gives that kind of nice middle tension vacuum where you really don't know. It starts off with a bomb to break up the party. Yeah, break it around. Everybody's in around. Where's that bomb? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, I can dig it. And of course, in Los Angeles, they just think it's a jet. But out, <laughs> yeah, you're right. So it's nothing at all, right? Or uh, a lot of poor people think they're speakers. But uh, it's actually on the record, and it's a very beautiful cut. And it's called um, "No Man Can Find the War." You see what I mean? Uh, particularly the people in the radio audience that listen to that inside their own home. There's a difference between sitting in a club, which is kind of an entertainment hall, and hearing that kind of music inside a place which you consider very much to be your own home, so it brings a lot more closely to you. But you get the feeling that when you come out of that, that it's not just a picket song and not just a which side are you on, right or left. It leaves you somewhat in the middle. Tell me something um, that I'm always interested in because... People talk about what people are like today and everything like that. You've played Boston. You've played the East Coast. You've, you've been in the Midwest. Have you done yeah. work out there? Yes. Do you get? Do you find that your audiences are younger and younger than usual? Do you find more and more very young people digging you? We get a pretty wide spectrum of people, personally. Um, but there's a lot of young people. A lot, a lot of times they can't get into the clubs. Yeah, right, because of that 18 law and stuff. Yeah, like so like we get a lot of people like in middle, late 20s, and then a few people in the teens. Yeah. That wouldn't affect you in a concert situation. No. Uh, no. No. You know, people are people, no matter when. I know. Ooh, yeah. Well, that's a piece of Stockhausen we'll be getting into later. Um, actually, I know one thing, that uh, that in the, uh, the record store on Fairfax, across from the Rainbow Cafe, which we insist on calling it until somebody proves us differently, that your album is selling like one of the two best albums selling there. And people say, well, of course, you know about that man. He sings for the hippies. It looks like a hippie is a hippie. And yet I met a man a couple of days ago who's really very straight man. He works for the conservation department. And he's got it, and he plays it up in his watchtower. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. He's just, just, he's, he sits up there looking for forest fires and listening to your music. After a while, he doesn't see the forest fires. You know, let him burn, man. It's, I'm, it's only on cut one. That's the problem. You're going to have to cut. Yeah, if you make longer cuts, man, California's going to go down. Uh, thing, that's uh, an idea. That's a great idea. <laughs> Slipping off to the sea to the sounds of you. Very nice indeed. Uh, you mentioned while we were while we were listening to uh, No Man Can Find the War that you're interested in writing a musical comedy for the legitimate stage. Not excuse me, not musical comedy, musical for the legitimate stage. Yeah, I'm yeah. thinking about that. Um, I want to do a third album. Yeah, and then um, uh, split. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Get, drop out. Yeah, and then because um, lately I've been really intrigued by how bad the stage is. <laughs> yeah, that's intrigued. Yeah, <laughs> I know what you mean. And it's really amazing what they pull off. You know, yeah, nothing, nothing of, of any real terrible worth is, is really much going on. There are a few, there are a few, few kind of interesting pieces that Mark Taper formed. Did you see the things down there? The scene and Musica. Yeah. There's some nice things. Yeah, there. those are good things. Those are good, but that's uh, that's kind of rare. You know. Yeah. Thank God for you know Phil Austin, and Phil Proctor, and that. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, was a <laughs> sideline hype. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, the fact is, is that you must have some special kind of musical in mind. You say you told me off mic again that it'll never get to Broadway. You know why? I just hope for one night. For one night, right? You want to be a what? You want to be a five hundred thousand dollar musical, <laughs> right, right? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's you. Mr. Merrick, I you don't have to drop out. Uh, you don't have to drop out. Don't let that boy in my building. Don't let him on the block. <laughs> writing that, writing that. Do you know what it's going to be about? Has it? Have you formed it at all in your mind? Um, musically, I have, and then yeah. um, choreography and all that stuff. Um, the plot is sort of. Uh, I've got a general idea. Yeah. You know. Something like what? Well, at the end of the show, we blow up New York. Oh, at the end of the show, you blow up New York. Oh, that's right. Sure. Oh. What, what did you say your name was? Uh, yeah, well, I'll have to call that's, us later. Yeah. That's why it's only going to play for one night. Right, exactly. Right. Unless, unless I went down to Broadway life. to see his show, but it wasn't there. Right. The show? No Broadway. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we have a cut of yours here called Phantasmagoria in two. Is the feeling of this piece at all like the kind of music you have in mind for this? Uh... No, it's completely different. I'll, I'll be into, like, um... well, it'll be probably close to what would be on the, the next album. The next album. Yeah. But um, 
Well, you know, what what can happen in a year, I don't know. Right, the river keeps years. flowing there. Yeah. You know that story that Siddhartha, when he was learning to become perfect or enlightened, spent a long time with the old boatman, and he wanted to learn his secret, which was peace, and the old boatman took him by the river and said, just watch it, just keep watching, mm -hmm. everything's going to be groovy. One of the nice things about having a guest on the show, particularly a guest who has long cuts, is that you can kind of like rap with him in between them and get all sorts of things turned on. And we came across uh, a mutual a mutual love in, in the in the person and the presence and the music of a man named Eric Satie. He's very beautiful. Great cat. Very great cat. You got that album, the one, the white album with the with the yeah. line drawing. Yeah. Up. You were telling us about his almost Arabian melodies. I wonder if you'd get into it again for. Uh, well, it's like he takes Popoli. he takes these. Uh, these uh, influences that you think it's almost going to be an identical uh, lift, and then he, and then it just trails off into something else. You know, it's just like these flavors are through the whole thing. It just falling sensation and coming back up again. Yeah, it's a, you know, a piano. He's using like a Eastern instrument. You know, he has that feeling. You know that. You know, he he went he through uh, a whole very straight stage where he wrote very straight things. He went to the academy and the whole thing. And then he turned around and dropped it, just totally dropped everything he was doing. He was an old man. I mean, you know, yeah. he was in his 50s or 60s, I think, yeah. uh, when he dropped out. And he did. He lived alone in this funny little room with his the covers on his bed, which he never changed, held down by gallon jugs full of water so they wouldn't roll off during the night. And he never wore the same shirt more than once. And when he died, they went into his, uh, uh, his little house, and there was just a pile of laundry in the corner, hundreds of shirts, because people were supporting him and buying him things. It really sounds like it. He was an incredible man. It really sounds so strange, you know, that's uninfluenced. You know. He wrote a piece called The Life of a, of a Musician, which has one of the great lines in it. He said, every night my servant comes in and takes my temperature and gives me a new one. <laughs> he wrote a piece of music called, uh, or three pieces of music called Three Pieces in the Form of a Pear. <laughs> that was one of his. And uh, straight, really. The thing about the animals, he describes all the animals. Yeah, he goes through, it's a whole jungle. Bestiary. Bestiary yeah. of animals. Yeah. Bestiary? Uh, bestiary? Bestiary? Yeah, it's it's about you, animals. It's about animals. animals. Yeah, there's a lot right. with animals. Yeah, it's really very good. Okay. <laughs> and uh, one thing I, I, I did notice that I wanted to mention was that I was driving down Sunset, and I saw that big, you know, billboard of you. But I, this is the first time I'd seen it, Dick. <laughs> now, you know, the, the Africans have this whole thing about, you know, like, they won't even let you take their picture, you know, because they figure that you get their picture, and then you tear it up and you witch things on it. But from a distance, I thought there was something wrong with your eye. You know, there was. I got that feeling that there was. I got this feeling there's something wrong with that boy's eye. And then a what? What was it? A piece of faceted glass that you had in it? No, it was a rusty a Pepsi Cola bottle cap. Oh, oh, of course. How silly of me! <laughs> right. It's an unusual trip. But you know, what you're trying to do is read on the inside to find out the price of a Toyota Corona, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> car, car. Right. Good. Good. Uh, so uh, I uh, I turned on to the album, and I would recommend that everybody who's, who's got an opportunity to do it, uh, do it. The name of the album is uh, Hello and Goodbye. No, or, no, 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 sorry, no, Goodbye and Hello. Yeah. That's the Beatles. Yeah. This is Goodbye and Hello. Well, as it happens, the album I have of yours, they have the, they have the paper reversed on it. They do. It says yeah. stereo instead of mono, and it says uh, hello and goodbye instead of goodbye and hello. Well, that's all right. You're kidding me. No, no, I'm not. I've got a rare one, baby. Really? Yeah, really. It's yeah. a first edition. It's a first edition. It's a well, cast over KRLA yeah. oh, in Pasadena. Yeah, in Pasadena, that's right. The best thing I've ever I'm going to learn how to do your record cues pretty soon. All right, why don't you try it? The record coming, coming up is called uh, Morning Glory. It is. It is indeed. Well, it'll be morning by glory if we don't play it. But before we do it, let us thank our mystery guests for coming on the microphone with us. It's really been... Thank you very much. And we want you to consider this kind of your home away from home or something like it, as long as the club is open. And, uh, well, I'll bring my bags in. Yeah, bring, bring your bags in tomorrow. And we'll see you very, very soon. And we'll be giving you some information later so it won't look too commercial about when you're coming up and where you're, where you're going to be for the next couple of weeks. You know what I mean? For all the troubadours who, who want to see you. Right, <laughs> 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 morning by glory. <laughs> Thank you.